This video is sponsored by Drift. In March of 2022, Megan Marone, a high school English teacher, headed out for a hike in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. She had planned a getaway for herself in the stillness of the trees, taking time to unwind from a particularly hectic school year. The only problem was, the weather that day was anything but accommodating. As storms were blowing in, freezing rain, wind, and snow beat down on the town of Stockbridge. Before long, Megan disappeared, and her family doesn't believe she visited the park that day of her own free will. They believe she was kidnapped. None of Megan's friends or family believe the official story from police, and the mountains of evidence suggest that Megan may have been harassed, stalked, or worse. Before we get started with today's story, I want to show you guys an amazing new product I found. It's being put out by Scentbird's new sister company, Drift. I'm sure you all know about Scentbird and the amazing fragrances that they put out, and Drift continues that legacy, designing fragrances for your home or car. All of the materials that Drift uses are sustainably sourced, and my favorite part is that all of their fragrances are pure, natural essential oils. With prices of around $9 for wood or metal products and only $14 for stone, it's difficult to beat the value that Drift offers. These scents are extremely long-lasting, giving you around 30 days of use per freshener. In your starter kit, you'll receive the scent and a clip that can attach to your car's sun visor or countless areas around your home. One of the coolest aspects of Drift is that they offer a scent of the month, which is inspired by the season, as well as all the memories and emotions you may attach to it. This limited edition fragrance changes every month in an effort to keep you from going nose blind, which is a very real thing in the world of fragrances. This ensures that your home or car continue to smell fresh year round. Drift subscription is super flexible and you can change the frequency of your deliveries as well as the choice of scent. Make sure you use coupon code TY55, that's TY55, for 55% off your first month at drift.co. You can check out links for Drift below. Thanks to Drift for sponsoring today's video. Megan Marone was a bit of a character. She was very eccentric. It was one of her characteristics that her friends loved most about her. She wasn't afraid to be the person that she wanted to be. She was weird, quirky, maybe even a bit off-putting to some people, but Megan was incredibly kind, loving, and always had the best interest of others at the forefront of her mind. Megan was the kind of person who anyone could depend on. Whether you were an old friend or new, Megan was there for you. She was also a difficult person to not love. She didn't have any ill will towards anyone as far as I could tell. Well, with the exception of one man. More on him later. Megan had a deep love for children and always wanted to make sure that they had the best chance at life. When you think of a high school teacher, you may think of a middle-aged man or woman who's truly at wit's end, hoping and praying for the summer months to come quicker, but that wasn't the kind of person that Megan was. She loved every moment that she had with her students. She had a true passion for educating the next generation, and this enthusiasm showed. She was always doing her best to keep her students engaged and interested in the work that she prepared for them coming up with interesting and unique ways of presenting her lessons and lectures. Being an English teacher, she had a profound connection with literature and the written word. She was known for her love of poems, and a comment from one of her close friends claimed that she had poetry plastered all over the walls of her home, presumably poetry that she'd written herself or poems that she connected with from other writers. Being a friend or colleague of Megan was truly a gift. All of her loved ones have echoed this sentiment. But everyone in Megan's life wasn't quite so friendly and caring. In fact, one man in particular took every opportunity to make sure that Megan's life, particularly her work life, was as miserable as possible. This man was truly despicable and took every opportunity to badger Megan, and some people believe this man may have been willing to go to great lengths to silence Megan once and for all. It's clear to see that Megan was a very outgoing and passionate woman, but her unique way of life, combined with her usual personality, was a bit of an acquired taste for some of her peers. Her childlike enthusiasm may have been a bit too much for some people to deal with, but her friends remember this as one of her most precious attributes. Megan began teaching at Shaker High School in New York sometime around 2018 or 2019. 
She was single and lived alone in Del Mar. She always pursued various relationships, but in Megan's eyes, she feared that a long-term commitment may simply not be in her future, though this wasn't for a lack of trying. Megan, being 42 years old, was a thrill to be around, but it seemed as though she always managed to attract the wrong kind of partner. She'd been hurt by more men than she cared to count, but all she truly wanted was to find a husband and start a family. But for Megan, this simply wasn't in the cards. She had always talked about her love for children and how she desperately wanted a child of her own, and as the years progressed, the weight of her desire to start a family began to drag her down in the darkest of ways with some descriptions of Megan's final moments suggesting that she may have fallen into a deep depression. But truthfully, this was the least of Megan's concerns in 2022, when an otherwise normal school year would turn into the stuff of nightmares. Unfortunately, we don't know all the specifics of what took place. Much of this information has been withheld by her family to protect her privacy, or she simply never shared it in the first place. All we know is that Megan had serious issues with one of her colleagues, a male colleague. When investigators spoke with her brother, he explained that he didn't know the full story, but he knew that one of her co-workers had caused her a lot of heartache. Another one of Megan's friends wrote a memoir about her, entitled Fragments of Megan, and went into a bit more detail but still refused to explain the full extent of the grief that Megan had been dealing with. All I've been able to piece together is that Megan had repeated run-ins with this man, and he seems to have caused her to fear for her life. According to a Daily Mail article, Megan was reportedly being brutally harassed and intimidated, seemingly on a daily basis by this man. If I had to guess, the context of some of these claims seems to suggest that the man may have been romantically interested in her, but that's purely a guess. Whatever his deal was, Megan wasn't into it, and she let him know this time and time again, but he just wasn't getting the message. As time passed by, his remarks and threats only grew worse. The situation grew to be so severe that the school board offered to let Megan have the remainder of the year off, even going as far as offering to pay her during that time period. Megan accepted this offer, and it appears as though she made plans to work for the school for the remainder of this year, then she planned on leaving and returning back to her friends and family who lived in Washington. According to a friend, the school was wearing Megan down like sandpaper, and she couldn't wait to get out of there. In the weeks leading up to the crime, Megan's upbeat and quirky demeanor had taken a downturn. This once happy-go-lucky woman was now a fragment of her former self, with her friends saying that her emotions had become disjointed and something inside of her had broken. We don't know if the weight of her troubles at school had become more than she could carry, or if there was much more going on than anyone could have known about. But during her time off, Megan decided to visit one of her friends down in New Orleans. The friend had been deeply worried about her, so she offered to spend a few weeks together with Megan to help her get back on her feet and ensure that she was okay. The friend hadn't seen Megan in person in about two years, considering they lived over a thousand miles apart, but when Megan arrived, her friend barely recognized her. Megan had lost a serious amount of weight and had been consumed by her anxiety. While she put on a strong front on the outside, inside, Megan was struggling to keep her head above water. Her friends say that she was very jumpy, acting paranoid, and every little noise made her come out of her skin, almost like someone or something was after her. Megan spent the following few weeks hanging out in New Orleans, seeing all the beautiful sights that the town has to offer. But before long, it was time for her to go. But rather than head straight back to New York, Megan had made plans to stay in Stockbridge, Massachusetts for a while, clearing her head for a few weeks to a few months before making her preparations to pack up her things in New York and head off to Washington to be with her family later on in June. But unfortunately, Megan would never get the chance to see her family again. In fact, Megan would never leave the state of Massachusetts. Megan had been staying at the Red Lion Inn in Stockbridge. On the morning of Sunday, March 27th, she asked an employee at the inn for directions to Church Street nearby. The problem is that there were two streets with the same name within a few miles of one another. One of these streets was located in Lee, while the other was located in Stockbridge. The employee gave her instructions on how to get to Lee, but Megan's friend believes that she intended to go to Church Street in Stockbridge, as it was next to a cemetery a place that Megan was known to frequent to connect with the spirits of those that had passed on. Megan had the belief that she could communicate with the energy and spirits of those who were no longer with us. 
This led her to often make trips to cemeteries in her local area and in the towns that she visited, finding peace in the presence of the dearly departed. Megan thanked the employee and headed off toward Church Street, but she was never seen again. By March 29th, two days later, Megan's family had not heard from her. She hadn't been calling or checking in as she usually did. Her family grew concerned and filed a missing person report. That same day, her car was found parked at a trailhead on Church Street in Lee. It's been reported that not only was her car found parked at the trailhead, but her car was actually blocking the entrance to the trail, a very strange clue that investigators seem to have glossed over. When detectives began taking statements from the locals, they learned that Megan's car had been left here since the 27th. Bad weather had torn through the area since Megan's disappearance, and it's been reported that terrible rain, storms, high winds, and snow had blown in. All the while, Megan's car was left there seemingly untouched. Police searched the vehicle and found that it had been left unlocked. Virtually everything that Megan was known to have been carrying with her was gone. Her keys, laptop, phone, hotel key, wallet, and her favorite stuffed animal were all missing. This was when Megan's friends knew that something was wrong, but it seems that police were still largely unconcerned. Investigators claimed that they had no reason to suspect foul play, but her family denied these claims. Still, detectives searched every square inch of the surrounding area for Megan, but they came up empty-handed. They sent out search teams, drones, sniffer dogs, and even diving teams to search all the nearby bodies of water, but there was not a single trace of Megan to be found. After her disappearance, locals, friends, and loved ones continued to search for her for several weeks. Missing person posters were put up all over town with a particular focus on the trailhead where she had disappeared. But this is where things get extremely interesting. Dozens of missing person posters were placed all throughout the trail where Megan's car was found. But no sooner than the signs were hung up, they were all torn down. Everyone thought this was strange. After all, who would want to tear down so many missing person posters? Her loved ones returned all of the posters back to the posts and trees where they had been, only for them to all be torn down once again in a matter of days. We don't know who is responsible for hanging all of these flyers, but whoever it was, they were growing tired of the games. So they decided to install a trail camera to try to catch who was doing this. Well, that didn't work either. This time, not only were all of the posters torn down, but the trail camera was stolen, taking all of the footage along with it. But it was around this same time that detectives got their first and only breakthrough in her case. Megan had been found. On September 1st, more than six months after Megan had gone missing, she was found, but not in the way that investigators had hoped for. It was announced that her remains were located on Fox Hollow Drive, about a six minute drive from the trailhead where she had presumably vanished. The only problem is that her discovery still yielded no clues. There was no sign of a struggle and no evidence left behind, aside from her remains, obviously. Megan's body was sent to the local medical examiner, and it took them quite some time to even confirm that the remains belonged to Megan. In the end, after this confirmation, all they were able to conclude was that Megan had THC in her system at the time of her demise, but nothing more. This obviously played no part in how she lost her life, meaning that the examination was essentially useless. There were no obvious signs of trauma, nor were there any broken bones. There was nothing in her system or nearby to suggest that she had taken her own life or that someone had taken her life from her. It was a total mystery what had taken place here, and all this time later, there's still no indication of what may have happened to her. But things get interesting when you hear about the remarks that her family and friends had made about her sudden and unexpected disappearance. Many of Megan's friends believe that she may have been stalked. It seems that these rumors are based on the fact that she'd been acting so strangely in the weeks leading up to her disappearance, but no one has revealed who may have been following her. The natural assumption here is that the stalker could have been the same person who'd been harassing her at school, and this is certainly a possibility. The drive from her school in New York to the area where she was found was only around three hours. In fact, Megan disappeared on a Sunday, so the suspect, being a school employee, wouldn't have even needed to miss work in order to find her and follow her. The man could have tracked Megan down, taken her life, and easily made it back home with time to spare, and none of his co-workers would have been the wiser. 
The plot only thickens when you hear a remark from Megan's brother shortly after her disappearance. GPS data was pulled, and it appears as though this came from her cell phone, but I honestly haven't been able to confirm where this data was actually pulled from. I'm just guessing here. But the data suggests that Megan never made it to the park on Church Street. Yes, her car was obviously found there, but the GPS data shows that Megan was never anywhere near that park when she vanished. Her GPS movement stopped several miles from the park, and they never moved again after this. Yet, her car was found parked right at the entrance to the trail on Church Street. I don't know about you, but this obviously means that Megan's car had been moved after she lost her life. Yet, police say that they found no evidence to suggest that foul play was involved. I, I can't even come up with words here. This is as clear as it gets when it comes to foul play. I mean, what can they think happened here? I mean, did Megan come back from beyond the grave to just drive her car three miles away? Someone had to have driven her car to the trailhead that day, but who this person was and why they bothered to move her car remains a mystery. Ever since her disappearance, Megan's bank accounts have remained untouched. None of her cards have been used, so even though her belongings were all missing, it doesn't seem like the suspect ever tried to steal anything else from her which essentially rules out robbery as a motive in my book. Police did search her car for DNA and fingerprints, but the results were never publicly recorded. It seems safe to assume that nothing of value was found here, or the person responsible would have already been brought in for questioning, and there's no mention of this ever happening. The last update that I've been able to track down was from December of 2022, and it appears as though police still only have the case classified as a missing person case, and it doesn't appear that Megan's disappearance is under investigation any longer. The cause of her passing has never been reclassified as a homicide, even though that's pretty clearly what took place here. While investigators never determined what exactly happened, they've given us every reason to believe that the case is now closed, and it appears as though they couldn't care less about getting to the bottom of things. I try to remain optimistic in cases like this. Maybe police will investigate things further if they come across new information. But for now, it seems like they're content with labeling this as nothing more than a mysterious accident. This is seriously heartbreaking for both Megan and for her friends and family, but with a police department that's so dead set on closing the case, there isn't really much else that can be done. As it stands, Megan's family and friends believe that they likely know her killer, and they'd love to reveal his name. But unfortunately, without any tangible evidence, we can't go around pointing fingers. All of her closest friends believe that the person responsible is most likely the man who'd been harassing her at school for the months leading up to her disappearance. But there's simply nothing that can be done if the police aren't willing to take these allegations seriously. In cases like this, I usually like to include a case number and a phone number at the end of the video, asking for you guys to call in if you happen to have any information. But with a police force that's so clearly incompetent, it would just be a waste of breath. Maybe one day Megan's case will be solved, but for now, we're left with nothing but unanswered questions and a mountain of evidence to suggest that someone had certainly been following Megan that day and it's almost guaranteed that she met her end at the hands of a bloodthirsty co-worker. I choose to believe that the truth will eventually come out. It almost always does. But for now, the case of Megan Marone is just another heartbreaking, disappointing tragedy. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you want to see more true crime documentaries like this, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, the best way you can do that is simply by leaving a comment below. Any comment at all. It helps out the channel way more than you may realize. If you want to help out financially, you can do that by clicking the blue join button below or by picking up a True Crime Stories mug from TyKnots.com. But with that, my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.